now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over. This week is the 96th annual Children's Book Week. It's the longest running national literacy initiative in the U.S. Joining us to discuss the importance of reading and what drew him to young audiences is the writer of over 160 books. He's author of the Seven Wonders series, including his most recent, The Curse of the King. Please welcome New York Times bestselling author, Peter Larangis, who's joining us from New York. Peter, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Now, I, I, I have read that y you saying you identify with outsiders from the time you were a kid until now. Why? I was a really bookish kid. Uh, I was not very athletic in a place where a lot of the other boys in my class were. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved reading. I loved losing myself in my imagination. My idea of a good time as a kid was to shut the door in my bedroom and put a pad of paper on the desk and huh. let my crazy ideas fly onto the page. Wow. Um, this was great. I loved, I loved that feeling of escape. I loved that feeling of kind of propelling myself into another world. Well, mm -hmm. you know, those things didn't necessarily sit so well with other little boys. Huh. So I found myself being, being teased a lot and, mm -hmm. uh, and having to kind of more or less retreat into the into those worlds that I would dream up. So I kind of identify I identify with 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 kids who are a little bit different, who hmm. who want to follow a path that that your other friends aren't necessarily following. Now now tell me how a guy with a degree in biochemistry from Harvard, no less, ends up writing children's books. <laughs> Where, how did this path happen for you? Utter confusion, really. <laughs> um, you know, growing up. Uh, let me give you um, an example. Growing up. I was about 12 years old. We, we had an assembly in my junior high school, and they hired a career counselor of some kind. I still don't know exactly what this guy did or who mm. he was, but he made an announcement that those of us in the audience being 12 years old by now should know what we wanted to do for a living. Mm. And of course, that petrified all of us because none of us did. Well, sure. this guy just went on to, to kind of tell us why you needed to do that. And at the end, someone in the question and answer session asked, uh, what if I want to be an artist? Or uh, maybe it was a writer or an artist or something like that. And uh, he said, well, there's a, there's a few things you got to know. Number one, you'll never make a living. Number two, you won't be able to support a family. Number three, you're always going to be worried about, uh, about your next penny. And he would just list these negative things one after wow. the other. And I remember sitting in the back and going to myself, oh, okay, that's not so bad. <laughs> oh, all right, now, who needs a family? <laughs> who needs I money? Mean, you know, who needs at 12 years old, right? <laughs> yeah. But I remember thinking even back then, um, you know, that's, that's something I would really want to do. I knew I had the ability to do it, and my teachers reinforced that. I had great teachers, and mm -hmm. my teachers all said, you know, you really, you have a flair for this. And I listened to them, and I took that very seriously. Mm -hmm. But the older you get, the more you get the signals that it's not a real easy life. It's mm -hmm. not something mm -hmm. that people really do if they want to be serious. So, of course, as I got older, um, I was the kind of kid who, you know, I did well in school, so I figured I should probably do something serious. So. Majoring in biochemistry was my way of putting my round peg into a square hole. Wow. I would have been the worst doctor in the world. I, I, I faint at the sight of blood. It would have been terrible. <laughs> you would never have wanted to have me as a doctor. But, but all um, of this so comes majoring back. Majoring in biochemistry was something I, I set I mean, aside. It, as I read the Seven Wonders series, which I want to talk about in a moment, th that biochemistry yeah. sort of comes into stark relief once more. And we can talk about that in a moment. Remind me. Uh, but you are Greek. Tell me how your visit to Rhodes inspired this Seven Wonders series and how the biochemistry fits in. My wife and I went to Rhodes on our honeymoon, and it was an amazing experience. Now, we have fa I have family there, so that, ah. was, uh, that, was, that was really what drew us there in the first place. But the island itself is, is magical. And we were sitting out in the harbor, and I pictured the Colossus astride the harbor. Um, mm. And it was the first time I'd ever seen it and had, to, had an idea of the scale of this statue. You know, it was the sun god Helios, and it guarded the harbor. And the idea that it would have, it would have towered over the ships that passed underneath it seemed absolutely impossible. I couldn't imagine how it could have been built. So that led to, um, that led to an interest in all of the seven wonders, and it really mm. came from that trip to Greece. And the more I learned about those seven ancient wonders, the more I realized that I didn't know what they were. Growing up, I'd never learned about any of them, and each one 
had the most fascinating story, and it became clear why they were they were considered so magical and so wonderful in in uh, in ancient in ancient mythology and mm. ancient history. Um, so I always parked in the back of my mind that I'd, I'd want to write about them someday. And, and where did the biochemistry fit oh, in? And how biochemistry, oh yeah, yeah, you, there's a little biochemistry piece about it. Um, <laughs> biochemistry has nothing to do with what I write, except for the fact that uh, I think when you, learn, when you learn the sciences, when you study the sciences in college and you do it rigorously, you, you learn about how to ask questions, and as a writer, you're constantly solving mysteries, mm -hmm. uh, and as a scientist, you're doing that too, and you're asking very logical questions, and you're setting it up, and you're not settling for anything but the right kind of answer. And when you write the plot of a book, you've got to do that too. You've got to be that oh. demanding on yourself, otherwise your readers aren't going to believe it. Mm -hmm. So no. in a way, it's connected. Yeah, and, and, and well, the open of the book in the first, in the, in the Colossus Rises, the first uh, Seven Wonders book, uh, we find Jack McKinley, your protagonist, your hero, and he's, he's He's in an operating room. He's in this odd place. He has the condition. Some of your biochemistry uh, background sort of had to inform a bit of that. Right, right. Because, yeah, well, that's, that's a good point. Because also we're talking a lot about genetics right. in this book. How is it that you can inherit something from centuries ago that doesn't express itself until 2015 or, or mm -hmm. 2014? You know, how, how is that? And it is possible. Um, and genetics has always fascinated me. So, yeah, I think that mm. having studied that it was a, a big part of this plot. Mm. You know, we are connected to our past through genetics. Mm. And by understanding it, we can understand who we are and where we come from. And, uh, you know, the, I was interested in exploring that in the book, too. Peter, you know, there's a connection I'd never seen before. Thank you. Yeah, no, well, I, I, it jumped out at me when I, you know, when I started reading the, your, your, your canon here. Uh, Jack McKinley, who, as I said, is your hero, he has to find seven objects hidden in the seven ancient wonders of the world. What do you think attracts children to this series? And then I'll tell you what's attracted mine to it. Well, I think part of it is that it's an impossible adventure. Mm. The seven wonders, six of them have been destroyed. How, mm. do you, how do you go about finding these magical objects, number one, even if the wonders were there, and mm -hmm. only one of them is, only the Great Pyramid is? Um, now, it's, it's life and death. They are 13 years old. They've only got till they're 14. So for, for me, I think part of the lure of it for kids is this time clock, is this idea that you've got one year, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And you've got to not only find these, but you've got to find the wonders, the wonders which have been destroyed by earthquakes, by, by battles. Nobody knows where they are. It's really, it's really dire. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they've got to do it, and they've got to do it using the skills that each one of them has, because that condition that they've inherited from this prince that escaped Atlantis centuries ago, this condition takes whatever they're good at already and turns it into a superpower. Uh -huh. So one guy's got amazing athletic ability, and the other, the girl, uh, Allie, is, is incredible in tech. I mean, she's got mm -hmm. the skills that could, that could tap into the United States government if she wanted to. <laughs> I mean, that, that level of, of expertise. And Jack, our hero, He's got some special skills too, but he doesn't know what they are. Huh. And he starts learning what they are as the books go along. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how middle grade fiction has changed in the time that you've been writing. And we should say, and I want to get into in a moment, uh, some of your previous work, but how has it changed, or rather how have the expectations changed? It's a good question. I, it, when you talk about middle grade, I mean, just to make it clear, because mm -hmm. these are really specific terms and maybe some uh, viewers don't really know what they are. Mm -hmm. um, middle grade is not middle school. Right. Middle grade in publishing is grades three, more or less grade, third grade through more or less seventh, right? Mm -hmm. the, the heart of it is fourth through sixth, but it's really third through seventh. Right. Above that is what they call young adult, YA. So there's right. a difference. With, with middle grade, um, I think the biggest changes actually have happened in the, in the YA or young adult arena. There's topics that we would never have dreamed of, of, of broaching even 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Middle grade hasn't changed as much. The things that were important to kids, I think, a generation ago are still important. They've just, they're making that transition from you, their primary identification being their parents to being their friends. They're negotiating what loyalty means, what, what, what 
honesty means, how, mm -hmm. how you're being true to yourself, true to your friends, and how you break away from your parents, how you connect, mm -hmm. you know, you make these connections with your peers, right? That's mm -hmm. what these books are all about. Plus, there's a heavy dose of humor. I mean, yep. at that age, kids laugh at everything, and they want to laugh at everything. So what I love, what I loved to read when I was a kid were adventure stories, because in adventure stories you take all of those choices, all of those decisions, all those moral and ethical decisions, and you pin them on really, really exciting, uh, you know, adventures like survival, Jack London stories about survival right. in the North, you know, Edgar Allan Poe stories about psychological survival. Mm. All of those things bring this all into really, really sharp relief. And I've, I think that's what draws me to adventure stories. And, and honestly, an adventure story that I, that I would have written 20 years ago might not be all that different from what I'd write right now. Peter, I'm launching a literacy initiative next year, or later in this year, and there are a series of questions that I'm asking all authors. These are rapid-fire questions, so I'd like you to take a shot at it. Your favorite children's book, and why? That's a tough, I've got to do it fast, right? Okay, um, Charlotte's Web, because, because the, its themes are so emotional and, and, and so economically written. Mm. Least favorite book? <laughs> well, uh, if I'm going to ask you the favorite, I'm going to ask you the least favorite, Peter. <laughs> the least favorite? Yes. The least favorite book. Yes, the Dick, the Dick Tracy novelization written by Peter Larangis oh. in 1990. Oh, calling himself out. Don't That's not it. fair, Peter. That's nice, but not fair. Uh, the story, <laughs> what is the story, or is there a story that helped you find your path in life? And is there one life lesson there that you've never forgotten? Yeah. The story was called To Build a Fire by Jack London. Ah. I read it when I was about 11 or 12 years old. Um, at, I was about the age of the target reader for my books. Hmm. The book was so affecting to me that on a really hot day, a 90 degree day in my bedroom, which didn't have any air conditioning, I was shivering from the cold because I identified so strongly with, uh, with the character who was trying to survive and trying to help his his husky, his pet husky, mm -hmm. survive. Um, it excited me so much that I felt so cold on such a hot day that I ran downstairs to tell my dad because I wanted to share that with him. But he was involved in a baseball game, and I just, sh I shut, I shut it down. I didn't want to share it. I wanted to keep it. It was such a special feeling. I felt <laughs> later. I'll tell him later. Ran back up to my room, finished the story, and when it was done, I said to myself, "That is, that is magic. The fact that he could make me feel so deeply." using just words, no illustrations, just words, is something that I think I would love to do someday. And huh. it changed my life. I began thinking that day that writing was something I wanted to do. Wow. Where do you write and why, Peter? I write everywhere. Um, I have an office that I rent from, I have an office that I rent in an apartment directly above mine in Manhattan. So I actually leave my apartment, go up 13 steps, enter another apartment, and shut the door, and I'm in a totally different place, but it's about six feet away from where I live, <laughs> which was great when my kids were young because, yep. you know, there, there's that barrier. I mean, I'm always there for them when they need me, right. but if I need to be by myself, they've got to go to another apartment, so there's this level, level of formality, mm -hmm. um, and it was great, and I've been doing that for 25 years. Wow. If you could choose one writer mentor from the past or present, it would be whom? Harry Mazur, and I had the pleasure of having him as a mentor. He wrote a lot of books uh, that were popular in the 80s and 90s, and he became a mentor and a friend of mine when I was a young writer. And when he, a few years ago, um, had a stroke, uh, it, he had kind of orphaned a book that he wanted to write hmm. called Somebody Please Tell Me Who I Am, oh, about a young uh, sure. GI who comes back having lost his memory. And, uh, and he could, Harry couldn't write the book. And my agent, who was also Harry's agent, said, Peter, you know, oh, how would you like to do that? How would you like to pick up that mantle and huh. go ahead and write the book? And, you know, there was only a couple of page introduction. So I got together with Harry and Harry's wife, and they gave wow. me the blessing to do it. Uh, and I had that amazing experience of taking an idea from somebody mm. that I admired and that I'd learned 
so much from, mm -hmm. and um, and turning, you know, make, realizing his dream, and also writing a book that was from my own. Heart. No, it's a beautiful book. I, I've read it. It's it, it really is quite moving. Well, it's, a, it's a soldier who comes back and has to sort of piece his life together. It's really well done. A advice to parents, Peter, who mm -hmm. want to get their kids to read. What should they do? Read to them all the time. Read to them every night. It establishes the value and the joy of reading books. One of the things that that we did when our boys were growing up was we, we it, no matter what happened we sat down every single night we opened up the book even if we were exhausted i remember one time my, when my boy, when my older son was very little i noticed <laughs> i'd fallen asleep while reading him and he he took his his fingers and he was prying my eyes open and he was saying daddy daddy keep going keep going I'm going, what <laughs> that's when you but know we, the story you know, and the reader are no good how tired we were yeah, right. And the other thing, you know, that I, w I would say that to, to parents, and a lot of them would say, well, you know, I'm not that good at it. They would say, you know, you're good at it. You write. You can do funny voices. You make mm -hmm. it so animated. But it doesn't matter. I've seen so many parents who aren't that skilled, who, don't, who read in kind of a monotone. It doesn't matter. Your kid is going to be absolutely uh, riveted. And I've seen this mm -hmm. so many times. And they will become readers. You know, it may take them a while. Some, mm -hmm. t some take longer than others, but establishing that, establishing the habit and the joy and the love and the, mm -hmm. and the togetherness that comes with a parent-child bond early on, associating that with reading, is absolutely invaluable. Before I let you go, this was the most surprising bit of research I discovered that you had ghostwritten a, a lot of those Sweet Valley Twins and the Babysitter Club books. How did this happen? <laughs> I was starting out, uh, when, I, when I graduated college after the big crisis of not knowing what I wanted to do, uh, I went into the theater for a while. I was an actor for mm -hmm. eight years. In between acting jobs, I failed miserably as a waiter. I was terrible. <laughs> I just, I kept getting fired from jobs. And I began instead freelance copy editing for publishing companies. Wow. By doing that, I was free to go off on auditions and classes. Mm. Now, when you start editing people, you're rewriting other people, and mm. your confidence gets better. I began realizing that I could do it. I could probably try to fulfill the dream that I always had of being a writer, and I did. I, would, I sort of wormed my way into getting <laughs> a few work-for-hire projects, and I started writing books. Now, at the time when I decided I was going to become a full-time writer, there was a lot of work being a ghostwriter for series like Sweet Valley Twins, Sweet Valley High, mm -hmm. and The Babysitter's Club. And that's how I got my start. Uh, started with the Hardy Boys. How the Babysitters and the Sweet Valley Twins happened is a little bit of a mystery to me because they called me huh. and they said, uh, you know, we'd like you to do this. And I said, well, you know, um, uh, I'm a guy. <laughs> I write and Hardy said, Boys. Yeah, we know, we know. Give it a try. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a Hardy Boys guy. Yeah, guy, guy. But uh, I don't know how it worked. And you know what? I mean, for me, uh, what I did was I went to where my strengths were, I, the humor. I put, a, I put a lot of humor into the books. Mm -hmm. And if I had to do cl clothing descriptions, which was the most <laughs> difficult thing for me to do because I didn't really know anything, I would take my, I literally would take my wife's clothing catalogs that she got in the mail. I would sort of flip through them and say, hmm, yeah, this character would wear something like that. And I would just copy the clothing descriptions. That it, I mean, it, know, it worked for, for you and for a lot of young women and girls who've read the book. So, Peter Larangis, thank you so much for, t for the time. <laughs> and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much, Raymond. Great to talk to you. And I would encourage everybody. Good luck with your book. The book is uh, The Seven Wonders, The Curse of the King. It's in bookstores now. It's a fantastic series, The Seven Wonders. Uh, it's available everywhere and online. Thanks again, Peter.